Hey mechanics friends, uh, hopefully you now have an idea of what the stress strain curve for a material looks like. Uh, now we want to go ahead and do an example problem. And so we're going to take some data and we're going to have to convert that data from our force elongation data to our, our force displacement data and we'll have to convert that into stress strain data. Then we're going to plot it and we're going to go through and we're going to identify the different regions, come up with the modulus of elasticity, come up with the yield stress, the ultimate stress, the strain at fracture, and uh, do all these calculations for a simplified set of data. Now I just want to point out this is going to be a simplified set of data so when we actually run this experiment in our lab you're going to see you know the data is going to be all over the place and we're going to have you know thousands of data points to uh, deal with. Um, here we're going to have just kind of a simplified case I don't know we have like 10 or 12 data points or something like that um, but we'll still be able to do the calculations and see how we perform these calculations uh, for the stress strain curve. So let's get started on our example. So we have a tension test that was performed on a steel specimen having an original diameter of 0 0.503 inches and a gauge length of 2 inches. The data is shown in this table. Uh, remember, when we run a tension test, we get load versus elongation data. We're asked to do a variety of things, plot the stress strain curve, label the four regions of the curve, come up with an approximate value for E, I come up with the yield stress, identify the ultimate tensile strength in the material, and then report the fracture stress and the fracture strain. Okay, so again, we recover load versus elongation data from our test. So the load is the value P, or the variable that we've been using for force. The elongation is going to be delta L, the change in length of the specimen. Um, also, we use the Greek letter little delta to represent elongation. So now we want to plot the stress strain curve. So I've just copied the data to the bottom of this page. Again, we have our force and our elongation data. But remember, we want to plot stress versus strain. So we want to solve for sigma and we want to solve for epsilon. Now we have to do this calculation, we have to come up with sigma and epsilon for every data point in our series. Now, I just want to do this for an example set. So I'm going to just kind of give you one example of the of crunching the numbers for this data. So I'll go ahead and I'll separate my page into stress and strain. And I'm going to look at the data for the load of eight kips. All right, so sigma, our formula is P over A, 0, where A, 0 is our initial area. Now, we'll, we're going to pretty much drop that 0 from the equation as we go on through the semester. Um, but just know that when we're talking about engineering stress, we're talking about the initial area. So if I take a look at this row of data, uh, my load value is P, um, which is going to be 8 kips. Now I have to calculate the initial area. So I know my area for my specimen, if I look over the problem, the problem said that the uh, tension test specimen had an initial diameter, original diameter of 0 0.503 inches. So from 0 0.503 inches diameter, I could divide that by 2 to get my initial radius, and then calculate the area as pi r squared or I can use the initial diameter and make sure I do pi over 4 times the initial diameter squared. So I go through, plug in my numbers, and I should calculate that the initial area for this specimen is 0 0.1987 inches squared. Plugging this back into my formula for stress, I can then calculate sigma. Sigma will be 40.26 kips per square inch. So our unit for kips per square inch is called KSI. So that's 40,260 pounds per square inch. So remember, one kip is 1,000 pounds. Now I need to calculate strain. My formula for strain is delta L over L0. So I have my elongation from my test. 
uh, and then I have my initial length. Now my initial length is the same as the gauge length mentioned above. So my gauge length is just a engineering term for the initial length of the specimen. So it tells me that my gauge length is 2.00 inches. I know that delta L from my test, I recorded that it was 0 0.0025 inches. So I plug that into my formula for strain, and I calculate that the strain is 0 0.00125. Now again, I have units of inches over inches, so my strain becomes unitless. Or I can think of it in terms of inches per inches. So for every inch of material, it stretches 0 0.00125 inches. So 0 0.00125 inches of stretch per inch of material. All right, I plug that in. Now we're going to have to do this for all the data points. So I recommend that as we do it, uh, if you have a large data set, you probably want to get used to using something like Microsoft Excel in order to tabulate all the data. So, you know, you can see the example calculations. You could set that up into Excel. You could drag and drop the formula to all the rows so you can quickly calculate stress from the measured load and you can calculate strain from the measured elongation. From here, we can now plot the stress versus strain curve. So I've taken this data, like I just said in Microsoft Excel, and I plotted a graph of stress on the y-axis and strain on the x-axis. Remember, stress versus strain, or y versus x. All right, that accomplishes task A. Uh, if we look on to task B, task B asks us to identify or label the four regions of the stress-strain curve. So remember what our four regions are. We have the linear elastic region, the yield plateau, the strain hardening region, and lastly, the necking region. So I want to go through and identify which these are. Uh, we see that the linear elastic region is this very short beginning region uh, where we have linear elastic behavior or where we have the stress is approximately proportional to the strain. Next we have the yield plateau. So we see in the yield plateau our force, our stress, remains approximately constant while the strain is increasing. So we see that kind of by that flat line portion of the stress strain diagram. Next we start to have the engaged the kind of reserve strength of the material or we have increased amount of force to cause additional deflection. So this is called our strain hardening region. So we see that the material strain hardens up to its max. And then finally we have necking where the test specimen starts to lose the amount of force it can carry as the cross-sectional area rapidly reduces, ultimately leading to fracture of the specimen. Next, we're asked to calculate the approximate value for the modulus of elasticity. So for this, I want to focus on just that linear elastic range, that beginning portion of the curve. So I've taken the same data, but I've drawn it at a different scale so that I only include the first uh, what, like seven or eight data points. So here I can more clearly see the linear elastic range. And the linear elastic range, the modulus of elasticity, is the slope in that linear elastic region. Now I can use any of the points along this line to create the slope. Uh, maybe in Excel I would even use a best fit line and use the slope of the best fit line amongst these five data points to figure out what the modulus of elasticity is. Uh, for this e example, I'm just going to use the first data point at 0, 0, and the fifth data point at the, you know, sort of end, at the proportional limit, if you will. Uh, and I'll use that to calculate the slope. So calculating slope is just rise over run. So I have my change in stress over my change in strain. 
So data point 5 is 55.36 KSI minus 0 divided by the strain 0 0.00175 minus 0. That gives me an approximate value for E of 31,600 kips per square inch. So that is approximately the slope of this line. All right, for part D, we have to identify the yield stress. And I want to walk you through the process of identifying the yield stress using the 0.2% offset method. So in the 0.2% offset method, we identify the point of strain at 0 0.002. So remember, 0.2% as a decimal is 0 0.002. And so I come into that value for strain and I plot a line that's parallel to the slope, um, parallel to that linear elastic region. So I plot a line at the same slope as the linear elastic region or at a slope of 31,600 KSI. When I do this, I then identify the point at which this new line intersects my data. So that is the point I drew with an X. I then figure out from this point I track it back to the Y axis and I can find out what my yield stress is. Now I could do a linear interpolation between the two data points that I have numbers for. Uh, as we'll see from the data points these actually have the same uh, stress reading. So I see that my yield stress will be 59.38 KSI. Great, we're moving right along through calculating these values. For part E, we're asked to identify the approximate tensile strength of the material. So when we talk about the tensile strength, we often refer to this as the ultimate tensile strength or the ultimate stress of the material. So this is F sub U. So this is the peak stress that our material handles before fracture. So I just come back up to my first stress strain plot where I can see all of the data and I see that my maximum data point is right there and I track that line back to the y-axis to figure out what my ultimate tensile strength is. Uh, this is just going to be the highest data point, the highest value of stress I have in my data set, which is 108.20 KSI. Now that we've identified the ultimate stress, we can tackle the last part of the problem, which wanted the stress and the strain at fracture. And so it's just important to remember that a stress strain plot is just an XY plot of data. So at fracture, fracture is the last point we have before separation occurs. There's the last data point we collect. So typically we denote that with an X. So I've gone ahead and sketched that X in here on the plot. And then I want the strain and the stress at fracture. So I just want the XY data point for that last bit of data. So I, if I check my table, I see that the strain at fracture was 0 0.23000 and that the stress at fracture was 93.10 KSI. So that is the stress and the strain at fracture. Uh, the question doesn't ask us to, but we can think about the percent elongation. So this one, if we look at the strain at fracture, the percent elongation is about 23%. So a little bit less than we saw with Steelio, but pretty typical for a high strength steel. We see that this is a high strength steel because it got up to an ultimate stress of 108.2 KSI. Well, I hope you're no longer stressed out or feel like the strain is too much. Uh, hopefully all of these engineering terms are becoming more familiar and you're seeing that you're perfectly capable of doing the calculations so thanks, to, thanks again to our friend Stelio uh, for helping to calm us all down today and uh, not get so uh, 
be so crazy, get back to our old selves. And uh, we look forward to the next lesson uh, when we continue to talk about some of the material properties uh, of ductile metals and we'll see how they change depending upon types of material and uh, some of the other uh, properties that we might be interested in doing some engineering calculations with.